Welcome to Atmosphere Church. My name is Jim Cruz and I'm the lead pastor. We're a new non-denominational life-giving church located in the Conejo Valley, just west of Los Angeles. Let me just say on behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for downloading or streaming this service. We pray that it'll touch your heart and change your life. In addition to bringing you today's service, we wanna make ourselves available to you in any way we can. Please leave a comment if you need prayer or if you wanna speak with one of our leaders in any struggle that you may be facing right now, we will be sure to respond to anything you need in your life. Here at Atmosphere, we believe that we should never forsake the gathering together with other believers. Don't use this recorded service as your church experience. Get involved in the local church to the extent that the people there know you by name. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be a part of our community. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, there's a lot of man hours that are put behind making services and resources like this available that are meant to help you grow and develop as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not just these things, but to also support the creation of even more resources for you and really for others who are also desiring to grow in their faith. To make a financial donation, simply click on the link on our site that says donate and your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Remember, when you give to Atmosphere Church, you're actually giving through Atmosphere to change lives in our church, in our city, and literally around the world. We've already prayed for you that today's message would speak directly to your heart and empower you to live the life that God has called you to live. Enjoy the service. Hey guys, Pastor Jim here, lead pastor of Atmosphere Church. And again, thank you for inviting us into your living room or from wherever you're watching. We're just so grateful to have you part of our church family. As you saw in that video, we are continuing our series this week that we started last week called Revival. And wow, you hear a lot of talk these days about revival because our nation desperately needs one. And so we thought, wow, it would be a great title for this series And this is a series based upon the second part of the book of Nehemiah that we've been studying over the last several weeks, even uh, the series that we did last time. But before I pray and we get into Nehemiah chapter nine, I just have to say, wow, God moved so big time uh, for our community yesterday as we went out there and did our serve day in the midst of a pandemic. And do we have some God stories for you? And I can't wait to maybe play a recap video perhaps next week for you. But uh, wow, I'm just so grateful for everybody that came out and was a part of our serve day. And hey, we'll be doing another one probably sometime in March or April. So stay tuned. Uh, If you weren't able to join us yesterday, you can join us for the next one that we do in the spring of 2021. That sounds so wild to say 2021. But I'm going to pray and we're going to jump in to the second message in this series called Revival. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for the way that you are moving in our church, God, the way that you are changing lives, Lord, that you are healing people and you're restoring families. Thank you, God, for how you're using even this series, talking about revival, to bring revival in our hearts so that you can bring revival in our nation. So speak to us this morning, God. We are here to listen to what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. You know, last week when we started this series off talking about revival, we came to the conclusion that revival is ultimately up to God. But we have to kind of be revival ready. We we have to prepare the landing strip for God to come and do want, do what he wants to do with us personally, even with us as a community, and even bigger and broader than that as, as a nation or as the world. 
And we talked about one of the first conditions that we need to focus on is renewal in the word of God. And we saw in Nehemiah chapter eight, how that really prepared the people of God in Israel, in Jerusalem specifically, that, you know, the city that Nehemiah had seen God use him to rebuild the walls and restore the gates. When they heard the word of God, it completely transformed their whole lives. And this week, we're going to talk about the second uh, condition of this idea of revival, and that is renewal in worship. So as Nehemiah chapter 8 talked about the word of God, Nehemiah chapter 9, as we see, uh, as we're going to read here, has to do with worship. And one thing that we kind of see throughout the narrative of Nehemiah, especially in the second part, chapters 8 through 13, Nehemiah kind of fades off into the background and now Ezra and the Levites and the priests and all the people surrounding uh, the, the whole order of God, they become kind of the, uh, the main characters of, of this narrative. And you see in this idea that they had been so removed from God for so long, like it's been probably four generations since, since they've really sat under like the authority of God and the authority of God's word for their life. And so it's like brand new for them. And anytime something is new in our lives, we tend to value it and appreciate it a lot more. I would even say that we tend to devalue things that become familiar. Uh, It's kind of like when you get, I don't know, like a new car. Uh, Some of you have had the the privilege to be able to go out and you know you get in that new car and you make a deal with the the car lot and you drive off the lot the car's got like 4 miles on it i remember the time i got my suv and i drove off the lot and i mean it was just like it was so uh it was so exciting um you know and and i told you know my family i said hey this is like a new car you know, that new car smell, everything shiny, the paint shiny, the, the carpet is immaculate. And I just told him, I said, hey, there's no eating or drinking in the car. You know, I was going to every parking lot. I would park as far away from the entrance of the store just because I was so concerned that somebody would ding, you know, uh, do a, uh, a little ding in my door from opening it in the parking lot. I was so careful and I was so cautious because it was new. I valued it so much. But as time progresses, right, and you get your first scratch or you make your first trip to In-N-Out Burger and you, you kind of cave and you let people eat in your car and, and pretty soon, you know, there's scratches on the car, the carpet's dirty, it doesn't smell like a new car anymore, it just smells like family, you know. It, it's one of those things that, just we, we tend to not value those things as they become more familiar to us. And we do this in everything. We do this in our marriages. For those of you that are married, we do this in the relationships with family. We even do this in our relationship with God, that this idea of familiarness actually breeds contentment or complacency. But these people are of Israel, these people specifically of Jerusalem had been so far removed from God, this felt like a new experience. So there was a renewal going on. And what I love about Nehemiah is God had shown them that he was involved with the rebuilding of the walls and the restoring of the gates. And when they saw, when they recognized that this was a work of God, this is a great work that God had done for them, that prepared the way for them to realize that God wanted to do a great work in them. This is the the beginning of the revival. So last week was the renewal in the word. This week is a renewal in worship. Verse one, it says, on October 31st, interesting, right? This is this coming up this week. This is the New Living Translation. The people assembled again, and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on on their heads. This is a, a real traditional way, according to the law of Moses, how they would uh, lament over their sin and they would worship God. It says, those 
uh, of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was uh, read out loud to them. Can you imagine that? You know, some people get antsy when a sermon goes longer than 40 minutes. Can you imagine sit, standing there for three hours while somebody is reading the law of God? And it says, then for three more hours, they confess their sins and worship the Lord their God. So there was a, a powerful moment as they are hearing the word of God read to them that they begin confessing their sin. And it's interesting that the word there in the Hebrew is yada, and that word also gets translated in several other places in the Old Testament as praise or worship to God. So this confessing of sin was a form of worship that they were doing, and I, I, I will tell you this, that the roadway to revival is positioning yourself to have a heart of worship. The roadway to revival is a heart of worship. So this morning, I want to look at Nehemiah chapter 9 and give you the CPR to jumpstart your heart of worship. The CPR to jumpstart your heart of worship. And so if, if you want to have a heart of worship, because you know worship isn't just a song that we sing. We're going to see this morning that worship is so much more than that. So we're going we're gonna to use this by, by giving you three main PowerPoints of how to have a heart of worship. So if you're taking notes, write this first point down, is confession, confession. And again, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 2, it says, they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. So, so they're going back. And they're reviewing all of the ways since they've now heard the law, since they heard the word of God proclaimed over them, they're realizing that, man, we majorly blew it. They're looking at their history and say, man, <laughs> look at the timeline. Like we, even though God told us not to do it and God said, if we do this, this is going to happen. We continued to disobey God and move our lives further and further from God. So they came back to a position to confess it. What, what they did is wrong. Now, when you hear the word confess, I think you put it in probably modern context and you think of probably somebody like a, a child telling a parent something they did that the parent doesn't know about. Or maybe a criminal is confessing their crime to the police, something that the police didn't know. So they're making their confession. Now, I, I wanna kind of give you an understanding when the Bible talks about confession, it's not like we're going before God, all knowing God and saying, God, I, we have something to admit to you that may shock you. Nothing you've done in your life is going to be shocking to God because he already knows what you've done. And so when the word of God talks about confession, the idea is coming into agreement with God that what you've done is not in God's will for your life. That the Bible calls sin missing the mark of God. So anytime that you make a decision in your life that misses the mark of what God wants for your life, that's sin. And so when the Bible talks about confessing your sin, it's talking about coming in agreement with God in his word that how you've behaved, what you've done, what you've said, that it, you are coming in agreement to say that I know that that's not what God wants wanted for my life. That's confession. First uh, John chapter one, verse nine says it this way. If, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So confessing your sin isn't so you might become a child of God. It's something you should do because you're a child of God because you want close fellowship with God. See, as a child of God, you don't have to continue to like confess your sins to be born again. You know, it's not like you have to, every time you sin, you have to be born again. So you're like born again and again and again. No, when you're born again, it's a done deal. You're a child of God. But the Bible says, even in the Old Testament, in Isaiah uh, chapter 
59 verse two, it says, it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. So it's not that you're cut off from God because you know you, you have that relationship with him. So it's not like sin severs your relationship with God. Uh, I would say it more strains your relationship with God. It, it creates an awkwardness between you and God when you have this unconfessed sin that the relationship is strained and it's going to be hard for you to connect and be intimate with God. So when you confess your sin to God, what you're doing is you're coming into agreement and you're saying, God, what I did, what I said, I know is not what you want for my life. So I'm coming in agreement. I'm giving it to you. And then in that process, not only are you forgiven and purified, but that relationship that was strained because of the sin is now repaired and restored and you are in this close, intimate uh, position with God. So I, I know it can be kind of confusing for some people that may be watching and, and you're, you're maybe not in a relationship with God. I, I tell you, your first step is to say yes to Jesus and invite him in to live in your heart, to be born again. But once you are born again, all of your sin is forgiven. You are moved into a, a position that you are a son or daughter of God and nothing can ever change that. However, your sin and, and sin that continues to happen in your life, and believe me, we all sin. It's not like Christ comes in your life and you stop sinning. There are things that God continues to progress out of your life, but there's always going to be imperfections in us as long as we're on an imperfect planet in a broken world, okay? So, so don't expect yourself to be perfect. However, this is, this is part of the process. When Jesus was asked by the disciples, how do we pray? And Jesus gave them the model prayer, uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. In that prayer, he tells them, like this is our daily prayer. He says, forgive us our debts or forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors or as we forgive those who have sinned against us. So it's interesting to me to note that Jesus is saying daily as we go before God, talk about your sin, confess your sin and say, God, forgive me, forgive us of what we've done against you so that you can get that relationship in, in a place of full restoration. So there's no strain in that. And so you can enjoy this closeness with God to where you can be intimate and, and God can uh, really speak really heavy revies uh, into your heart, okay? So that's the idea of confession. Now, the second thing, just write this down, the second PowerPoint, this is the part of the CPR, is praise. So the first one is confession. The second one is praise. Verse five, it says, then the leaders of the Levites called out to the people, stand up, and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed, may your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. Praise is an acknowledgement and appreciation of what he has done for us. It's our way of giving God thanks. Uh, thanksgiving and praise throughout the Bible go together like hand in glove. Uh, I really believe we can't praise without really uh, giving thanks to God. Um, and so this is part of our worship. So to be renewed in worship, we give praise to God. We acknowledge not just what God has done for our life, but who God is in our life. And there's a lot of gratefulness when it comes to praise. You're, you're acknowledging that even though you've been unfaithful, even though I've been unfaithful, that God is always faithful. Nehemiah chapter nine, verse 17. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and merciful, slow to become angry and rich in unfailing love. You did not abandon them. So throughout Nehemiah nine, it's reading this narrative of the way that the Israelites have turned their back on God. And so as it's going down play by play from all the ways that they've been disobedient and have turned their back on God, 
you know, the, the Levites pause and say, but God, you've always been faithful. You've never turned your back on us, even though we turned, your, turned our back on you. So they're acknowledging this faithfulness of God and it made them gratefulness. It's the gratefulness for God's faithfulness. Aren't you grateful that even though maybe you've turned your back on God several times, aren't you grateful that even though maybe you've kind of been a prodigal son or daughter for a season of your life, then you turned around and you came back that God was not there to be mad at you or to be angry with you, but that he greeted you and threw a party for you, that you came home, that, that his, his faithfulness is so amazing despite our unfaithfulness. And you see this pattern throughout Psalms even that David would be going through a hardship in his life and, and he would have all kinds of circumstances that weren't working out for him. And he would, he would often end the Psalms by giving some kind of a praise to God. And, and I think this is so good for us to understand because we tend to be people that praise God when things are praiseworthy in our life. When things, when I call it living in the land of hunky doryville, it's just like everything is flowing the way we want it to flow. Things are going the way we want them to go. And life is just kind of a blessing everywhere you look. So it's easy to praise God in those seasons, but to be renewed in worship, we have to be able to praise God in all seasons of our life. When's the last time that you've praised God, even though the circumstances that are surrounding your life aren't really, let's just be honest, praiseworthy. You know, they're, they're not really in this position where, where uh, it's easy for you to, to celebrate God. Those are the seasons that I believe it's, it's most vital to praise God, even when the circumstances aren't lining up for it. And I, I just want to throw this out there too because praise is so important. Some of you are thinking uh, sometimes, you know, when people are worshiping, they're, they're raising their hands and you might think that's odd or weird or maybe it's awkward or uh, maybe you've been in a, in a worship setting and, and people were, were doing that and you didn't know how to respond. Let me tell you that raising of the hands in praise kind of go hand in hand. And you may have never heard this before, but let's go back a chapter. Let's go back to chapter eight and read verse six. It says, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen and amen. They were saying, we agree with this. We agree with this. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they hear these amazing things from Ezra about God and immediately their hands go up. It was a form, it was an expression of thanksgiving and praise. And you see this throughout the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 63 verse four, I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I'm gonna challenge you this week as you have your prayer time as maybe you throw some worship music on yourself in your car or at home is is just practice. It's like raise your hands because I believe it's an expression of praise and this is going to help you, my friend, be renewed in worship, which then creates a condition for you to experience a revival because before you uh, you know, can expect a revival out there, you have to be receptive to a revival in here, in your own heart. And when we begin to experience a personal revival, then we can position ourselves to be ready for a national revival. But, but don't expect something to happen nationally if it's not even happening for your own life. So embrace that. And you know, raise your hands, lift up your hands. And it's, and it's one thing to be able to lift up your hands at church service. And next time you're at a church gathering, try that. Try lifting your hands up and maybe you've never done it before. Man, I love raising my hands. And I don't know what it is. Maybe I just like to talk with my hands anyway. So it's natural for me to raise my hands. But it, it's, it's easy for me and it's, and it's almost normal for me to raise my hands in worship at a church setting at a gathering but can you lift up your hands in other environments? Uh, it was a few years ago, I was running on the treadmill at the gym and I was listening to some worship music 
And all of a sudden I felt the Holy Spirit just rise up in me. Okay, I'm, just, I'm getting it on the treadmill. And I feel the Holy Spirit just rise up in me and say, lift your hands. And I'm like, okay, number one, if I lift up my hands right now, I may fall <laughs> and I may be on a YouTube video uh, or I may go viral here. But number two, what are people gonna think about me around this gym? But when I went into that mindset, there was a demeanor that came over me that I was more determined than ever to raise my hands because it's in that setting that I, I, I wanna bring my praise before God and not be ashamed of it. And so I lifted my hands at the gym. I don't know what other people thought you know, was happening for me or with me. Uh, maybe they just thought I was a weirdo or whatever, but it didn't matter because in that moment, I knew that the Holy Spirit was calling me to do that. So I did it. Maybe somebody at the gym needed to see that, maybe for their own life. Maybe they were going through a hard time and maybe when I lifted up my hands and praise God, maybe inside they were already a believer and something rose up in them to say, you know what, I need to praise God regardless of my circumstances. Can I tell you something? Somebody's watching this morning. Your circumstances suck. I'm just gonna say it right now. And that may offend some of you, but some of you are like, they do, pastor, they honestly do. You know what? Are you willing to raise your hands and lift up God's praise, even though the circumstances suck? Because I'm telling you, your breakthrough could be in you lifting up your hands, even when the circumstances aren't the way you want them to be. That's a word for somebody that's watching this morning, all right? Can you receive that? So that's the praise. And here's the third thing, write this down. And this is something that you don't hear preached very often, but that is repentance, when you, when you think of worship, not a lot of people correlate repentance with worship, but you see it throughout this entire second part of Nehemiah. There was a repentance just oozing out of the people of Jerusalem, but you'll see it right at the very end of chapter nine, and it just kind of tees up chapter 10, which we'll talk about next week. But this is what it says in, in verse 38. It, it's almost, I, I could have said like probably they should have started chapter 10 here, but I love it that they included it in chapter nine because it, it does show you the repentance aspect. It says the people responded after they had just like kind of reviewed their history and saw all the ways that their ancestors just missed it and made mistakes and missteps. They said this, the people responded in view of all of this, we're making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders and the Levites and the priests. So they signed a letter. They, they basically did like a declaration of repentance. They're saying this was the former way that our ancestors decided to forget about God and live according to their own ways into their own desires, but not us. We're returning to God and we are completely doing an about face and, and we are making our way towards getting closer and closer with God. And they, they signed a document. That's wild. But I love it because repentance is simply a changing of one's mind. It means that you're going in one direction and you're making a 180 and you're, he you're heading the other direction. That's what repentance is. And the Bible talks about repentance from all the way in Genesis to the book of Revelation. It's a part of the narrative of the gospel. So it's impossible for you to have a heart of worship without having a heart of repentance. And nobody is going to live perfectly. I already said that earlier, but you have a mindset shift to saying, I'm not living like I used to. I'm living according to the ways of God. It's, it's not like I'm living perfectly, but I'm striving to live differently. That's the difference right there. And I, I love how Romans 12 verse one in the Passion Translation reads this because the idea of repentance here in this passage with Nehemiah is that when, when you decide that you're gonna worship God, it's gonna affect not just your lips. It's not just gonna affect how you sing songs that a, a heart of worship impacts a lifestyle. It, it, it shifts your, your whole entire lifestyle. Romans 12, 1, Passion Translation, it says, Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? 
I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be a sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness. That means set apart for God's use, experiencing all that delights his heart for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. So living this lifestyle of saying, I'm going to live a different kind of life. I'm going to move my life towards the ways of God instead of away from God. It's not just a lip service anymore. See, worship is more than a song you sing. It's a lifestyle you live. It's more than a song you sing. It's a lifestyle you live. Isaiah 29 verse 13, they, the, the people at the time that uh, Isaiah is prophesying this, they had a problem. They were acknowledging God with their lips, but their hearts were moving in the wrong direction. They weren't moving towards God. They were moving away from God. So isn't it weird that their lifestyle was moving away from God, but yet they were still singing songs. They were still saying the right things with their lips. This is what Isaiah says. He says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Listen, just because you're in church worshiping God and, and singing the right songs and knowing the lyrics to sing doesn't mean you have a heart of worship. If, if your lifestyle it isn't moving in that, that direction of the ways of God, then, then you, my friend, are just giving lip service to God. And it's gonna be hard for revival to take place in your life personally if you're not experiencing this heart of worship, which involves repentance. And beyond all of that, let me tell you, repentance leads to your own personal refreshment. Repentance leads to refreshment. Listen to what it says in Acts chapter three, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The lifestyle that you're living that is moving away from God Man, the, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But when you turn your life around and you start moving your life towards God, which is repentance, there's a refreshment that comes with that. So not only are you positioning yourself for revival, you're also preparing yourself for refreshment. Who wouldn't want that, right? So one of the most beautiful pictures of a heart of worship is found in the New Testament. I'm, I'm gonna kind of land and conclude the message by telling you this part of the gospel uh, in, uh, it's found in Luke chapter seven. And Jesus is invited over to a Pharisee's house for dinner. So this Pharisee's there, I don't know if he's trying to trap Jesus, trying to show off to Jesus, maybe just trying to figure Jesus out because Jesus just didn't make any sense to the religious people of his time. So here they are having this kind of nice dinner at, at Simon the Pharisee's house and there was an interruption. <laughs> And if you know the gospels, you know that anytime that Jesus was interrupted, there tends to be a miracle moment that takes place. And check this out in verse 36 through 50. I'm just gonna read it. You can read along on the screen. It says, now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping and began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who was touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, okay? So he's having this thought bubble and Jesus answered his thought bubble. He says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. He says, a money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my, my feet with perfume. 
For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the women, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is one of the most beautiful pictures of a heart of worship that you're going to read in the entire Bible. This woman who was a sinner, who was caught up probably in prostitution, who was there knowing and recognizing who Jesus was, was there to just give everything that she had in her heart. This jar of perfume, this alabaster perfume, uh, was uh, said by most Bible scholars to be uh, worth a year's salary. And it's also a burial perfume. perfume. So maybe there was a a prophetic nature in this about the soon coming death of Jesus. But regardless of all that, I want to focus in on the, the contrast between how Simon the Pharisee handled Jesus and how this woman handled Jesus, because that's the point of this whole narrative is to show you what a genuine heart of worship looks like versus somebody that is just going through the motions. Yeah, sure. Simon was a religious man who did religious things, but when it came down to their heart, his heart was far from God. And this woman's heart was endeared to God. And she gave everything that she could. And she opened up her whole heart and poured out everything that she had to worship God. Now, here's my challenge or question for you watching this morning. Regarding these two characters, your life right now, which one would best represent your worship to God? Is your worship to God just kind of common, ordinary, familiar, you just kind of feel like you're going through the motions. You just kind of say maybe your morning prayer, maybe you go to church and you kind of sing along with the band, but there's just this, I don't know, this disconnect that happens. You're just, you're there, but you're not there. Jesus and and him dying for your sins, you've heard it so much, it's just common, it's so familiar. And, and you know that it's it's brought this this contentment, this, this uh, complacency uh, that is just kind of settled in your heart? Or are you more like this woman? Are you recognizing that if it wasn't for Jesus entering into your life, you wouldn't have a life. You, you wouldn't have a marriage. You, you would be a, a, just an utter mess uh, to everybody. But because Jesus has come in your life, and he's filled you with the power of his Holy Spirit, you have been changed. And every time you think of Jesus on the cross, you recognize that, wow, I was so messed up and I was so far from God. But despite how messed up I was, despite how far away from God I was, Jesus died for me. And I'm forever grateful for that. And whatever I can do, I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to lift up my hands no matter where I'm at. And I'm certainly going to give God a lifestyle. I'm not just going to give him the words of a worship song. I'm going to give him my lifestyle. I'm changing directions on how I'm living my life. And I will tell you from personal experience, I've been Simon the Pharisee. I've been serving Jesus for almost 30 years now. And I've had seasons of my life where I've been more like Simon the Pharisee than I was like this sinful woman. But it sounds really odd to say this, but we need to become more like the sinful woman than Simon the Pharisee. That's just what it is because it's that heart of worship that really sets us up to experience the personal revival that God wants to bring in our life. And Communion is one of those ways that we get to embrace the the hugeness, the bigness of what Jesus really did for us. And he said, as often as you eat and drink, do this in remembrance of me. So as we take Holy Communion, the Eucharist, you know, the the bread and and the juice or the wine, as we take communion, there's there's supposed to be this like pause and this, this reflection 
Paul even says in the New Testament, uh, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, when you take Holy Communion, examine your hearts. So not only is it a good time to remember the significance of what Jesus has done for your life, it's also a time to reflect the condition of your heart. And before you take communion, if you feel like your heart is, is maybe gotten a little complacent, it's, a, it's in, a, in a place of just uh, you know, familiarness and commonness, it's just kind of moved you away from this heart of worship, then take some time and say, God, bring me back to that heart of worship so that, that I can experience everything that you want to do just as the people of God in Nehemiah chapter nine experienced you and confess your sin. Acknowledge that even though you may have blown it, that Jesus's death on the cross has forgiven you and then take the elements of communion. And I know you're at home and we, we can't pass communion elements out to you, but hey, you don't have to like have a certain kind of communion, uh, you know, juice or bread. Just grab a slice of bread, grab some juice or something to drink. And you do this in remembrance of Jesus and you make whatever that drink is uh, your communion. All right. And just take some time today, reflect on that and have that heart of worship. And as we just uh, uh, end this time, we're going to pray and we're going to go back into one more song. And maybe even as we're doing this song, you could go grab that, that cracker, or that piece of bread and, and grab that juice. And as we sing this song at the end, you could take uh, communion and, and really experience that heart of worship that will really make it uh, possible and, and the conditions achievable for you to experience that personal revival that God wants you to experience. So pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for the way that you're using that CPR on us to jumpstart our heart of worship. God, if we've been like Simon the Pharisee and the things that, that are so holy and sacred and, and so worthy of praise have become so common and familiar that, that they've lost the, the, just the hugeness and, and the uh, blessing of what it really is. God, return us to that place to be more like this woman, just sitting at your feet with our tears, wiping your feet with our hair, enjoying the moment we have at your feet. And God, in that holy moment, God, meet us in that. Revive our hearts. Lord, let revival come into our life. God, I pray that for those that are struggling in circumstances that are less than ideal, God, that you would give them strength to lift up their hands and, and to praise you despite their circumstances and regardless of their circumstances. God, we just give this time to you and we're gonna praise you and we're gonna worship you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, as we sing the song, remember, go grab those elements and celebrate communion as we worship together with this last song. Hey, thank you for tuning in today to another message from Atmosphere Church. If this message has spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on YouTube, iTunes podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and even on Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and click either the follow or subscribe buttons. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. And until next time, we pray you'll keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love. God bless you.